Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Intersex Invisible No More. We're really excited to have this Pride kickoff event to be focusing on a subsect of our community that has gone untalked about, as we have seen in this uh, description here, really taking it out of the closet and having some true and difficult but necessary conversations. Uh, some housekeeping items, if folks need a restroom, feel free to go out the doors through the back and it's around the corner for you, or there's multi-stalled bathrooms on the second floor. Um, and other than that, I just want to thank our subcommittee that worked very hard on putting this event together. Uh, a shout out to Wendy, to Hajar, to Janet who's not here with us today, and to Bethany as well for all of their hard work in putting this together. Thanks. And also a big thank you to Pride Center of Vermont for their work in advancing rights for the LGBTQIA community. It's my honor to introduce the director of the health and wellness program from Pride Center of Vermont, Kel Arbor. Welcome, Kel. Thanks, Taylor. Some of you know that I didn't literally get the tiara, but Taylor was in my position right before me, so it's always fun for you to introduce me. <laughs> Uh, my pronouns are Faye Fear, and down at the Pride Center, we do a lot of different work. Part of it is training healthcare providers, and what I really appreciate about intersex activism is the parallel narratives for trans care, bodily autonomy, informed consent, people-centered care. There's a lot of intersections to boost, and so I'm really grateful for more conversation. For some folks, um, if you don't know, the yellow and the purple circle is the intersex flag. This is the inclusive progress pride flag, so just just having images, it's important to both have us be able to identify ourselves and see ourselves in the words and images, and also the culture shift with respect is we immediately can do better to believe people and to get this medicalization of our bodies for all people. And I think for intersex folks, that's especially big because intersex isn't a word that a lot of medical providers are using. Even though it's a community term, there's 30 or 40 different classifications and we know the long history of using medicalized language and how that keeps us away from being holistic people. So I'm really excited to have this talk be part of Pride Week. We always want to bring more activism and edutaining education back to the fest. We've got a week of events coming up, so if you're excited for what really is the day three of 12, um, the Pride Center of Vermont website, everything's on the calendar, and we have some info and resources, including naloxone, overdose prevention, supplies, free socks, COVID tests, and some information. So thanks so much and enjoy. Thank you, Cal. I did not know that this was day three of 12. I didn't know that there were 12 days of pride here in Vermont. Um, it is a form of Christmas. Um, but uh, culminating in the Pride Festival and Parade this Sunday. Uh, so if you have not been here for the parade before, it gets larger and larger every year with the festival at Waterfront Park afterwards. But without further ado, I'm really excited now to show you all uh, a short film called Common as Red Hair. My goodness, uh, can we give another round of applause for that amazing film? And feel very lucky today um, to have an extraordinary woman, the executive producer of this short film, um, but also one that I had the privilege of meeting just a month ago, but had followed her work for many years prior. Um, Kimberly Zieselman is here with us today, who is an intersex woman, lawyer, and human rights advocate based here in the United States, and actually, if I can say it, right here in Vermont, um, who is currently working as the Senior Advisor on Global Intersex Rights for Outright International. She was previously um, in the Biden administration as a Senior Advisor to the US Special Envoy to advance the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons. And as a leader in the field of intersex rights, Kimberly participated as the sole American intersex participant in the 2015 expert intersex convening by the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and is an official signatory to the historic Yogi Yakatora uh, Principles Plus 10. 
In 2020, Kimberly also published her own uh, book, XOXY, an award-winning memoir about her personal and professional intersex journey, which I will just say there are bookmarks available outside so you can purchase your own book. Um, let us welcome Kimberly. Thank you so much for being here today. And helping to moderate this conversation um, is my amazing boss, our Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Patient Experience for UVM Medical Center, Dr. Marissa Coleman. Thank you both. Can you all hear? Oh yeah, that works. Hi everyone. Wow. Thank you for coming on a Friday night of Labor Day weekend. This means a lot to have you here listening and learning about this issue um, that is so near and dear to my heart. You know, I helped write that script, and I was actually there when they filmed over a weekend, and I've seen it hundreds of times, but I still tear up, particularly in that greenhouse mm -hmm. scene where she's confronting her parents because it's just so, you know, personal. So, mm -hmm. <sighs> um. Yeah, so how would you like to begin? I, I would love to ask some questions, but first want to just acknowledge. So for folks that may still be learning, mm -hmm. can you define intersex for us and what the key issues are for the intersex community? Sure. So it, as you've heard, but I'll repeat, intersex is um, a descriptive word that describes someone with innate variations, physical variations of sex anatomy um, that are not typical of male or female bodies. Um, it is about 2% of the population, as common as red hair, and there are about as many intersex people today in this world as the entire population of Japan. So... We're not all that rare, we're just very typically invisible. And that's been due to the shame and the stigma that's been put upon us by society for having what I like to refer to as non-binary bodies. And it is um, something that is thankfully coming to light in many different ways. Um, I'm a big believer in storytelling to raise awareness and to change hearts and minds. So while my day job, um, has been advocating uh, at government levels mostly, both you know, local and, and um, state and national and now international. The storytelling piece and the lifting up authentic lived experience of, is, of intersex people is really crucial and nothing's gonna change without that. So I'm hoping that this little film in at least some small way contributes to that dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to contribute to it a lot. I mean, just the, I, I was thinking, I, we had a chance to speak briefly mm -hmm. before um, the film began, and I was sharing with you um, uh, how I'm a psychologist, and the whole, we'll get to it towards the end of the questions, but the arc of the parents. Yes. And the, um, throughout the developmental stages of their child, um, and what, again, that ending scene was so incredibly powerful, too. Well, uh, I think one of the differences for intersex, though, is that sometimes this is an issue that comes up immediately after a child is born, mm -hmm. before they can even speak or mm -hmm. clearly don't have a sexuality or gender identity yet. And that is one of the unique uh, things about the I in the alphabet soup, is that I think many of us are vulnerable to harm and discrimination like the minute we come into this world. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're talking, the biggest issue actually globally for the intersex community really is these medically unnecessary, irreversible, and non-consensual surgeries, right? It's all about bodily autonomy. So we're not talking about people of a certain age who have the capacity to make their own decisions, changing their bodies. That's, of course, great. Mm -hmm. It's the um, unconsented mm -hmm. surgeries that are an issue. But I can tell you, I have firsthand knowledge of places in, say, Asia and Africa where an intersex child that's born with uh, visible sex characteristics, usually genitals that don't look either fully male or female, can, are at risk of being killed. Infanticide is real, mm -hmm. if not abandoned. And those that live face horrid discrimination and abuse. So this is today, in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, 
So today in 2024, just to be clear, these surgeries are happening here in the United States at hospitals across the country, mm -hmm. um, as well as the rest of the uh, rest of the world. And there are other issues affecting intersex people as well, um, who mm -hmm. are adults, you know, mm -hmm. having sometimes issues around changing their gender markers, you know, self-attested legal gender recognition, which also is a huge issue for many in the trans community, can be an issue for some people in the intersex community as well. Um, and I guess the other thing I just want to say quickly is to say that intersex is a very broad term. So there are many ways to be intersex, as you can probably tell already. Um, there are many different variations, so it can affect different parts of your body or different internal organs, but also the way it shows up in the world. Um, some people struggle with their gender identity, many don't. Some, some identify as queer or uh, are um, attracted to same-sex partners, some don't. So an intersex person can be any of the other letters as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. But there are some unique differences. Thank you for, yeah. for naming that, just the diversity even within the community. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you could share a bit about how you got into this advocacy work and the making of the film, and as you're comfortable, please share some of your personal story. Sure. Um, well, I was born, no, the only reason I'm bringing up where I was, my birth was because I was born here at the UVM Medical Center, actually. Um, I think it was called the Mary Fletcher Hospital, yep. just going back a couple of years. <laughs> um, it's gone back so far that my mother, <clears throat> I've, both my parents come from this area, the Burlington area, Charlotte to be specific. And so even though I never lived with them as an infant here in the, here in, um, I'm so used to being elsewhere, here in Vermont, um, my parents were here when my mother went into labor. And she relays stories about how, first of all, her OBGYN who delivered me also delivered her. So there's that. And she talks about the fact that they would smoke together during her office visits. So things have changed a bit. And so I share that story just because it's funny and horrifying and also to show that things change, medical practice changes, you know? And so there's hope for medical practice like this that we saw today to change. And I did go to the University of Vermont, too, so I wore my groovy UV green <laughs> in honor. Um, so it's really fun to be back in Burlington. And I live in Manchester a couple hours south now, but I left after college and came back. Mm -hmm. And I got into this intersex activism very late in life. Um, I also had surgery. I was older than Mary in the film. I was a young teen. This was in the 80s, before internet. And so... Um, I was told a bunch of lies. My parents were even lied to. And um, I was told that I had partially formed female reproductive organs that would become cancerous if I didn't have them immediately removed. Mm -hmm. What took us to the doctor was I'd never had my period. And so it was like, okay, mm -hmm. you're 14, let's go figure this out. Mm -hmm. So there was this rush to surgery, like it was an emergency, and the cancer word, and this is a very common story mm -hmm. in our community, um, particularly with uh, intersex people like myself who have my condition, which is androgen insensitivity syndrome, is uh, there was this cancer scare. And so basically, I had surgery. They removed my internal gonads, which were healthy testes. I've seen the pathology report. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that until much later in life. I was told, you know, that lie to just sort of like go on with your life. Um, mm -hmm. You're never going to have children. Um, otherwise, you know, this is just a private thing. No need to talk about it with anyone else. And while I was under, they must have examined my vaginal area because after, in a post-op visit, they relayed to me and my parents, I have vague memories of this, that they wanted to do a vaginoplasty on me so that I could have sex someday with my husband. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of assumptions being made at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I escaped that horrific surgery, particularly horrific in 1982, whenever it was. Um, and I've been married for 32 years to a man, and everything's just fine, I can assure you. <laughs> um, so. That's how I got into it at a personal level, but it was at age 40 that I got my medical record. So flash forward, mm -hmm. I went to college here at UVM, mm -hmm. ended up going to law school. Mm -hmm. 
I discovered my medical records um, and was shocked to see, to learn about the androgen insensitivity in sensitivity syndrome, testicular feminization, male pseudohermaphrodite. These are the words that were on my on my chart, uh, in my file that I dug up. And so the next thing I did was go online and find find some online support. Um, there there was an intersex, actually it wasn't even called intersex then, support group. And flash forward to after a couple of years, a sort of taking care of myself and connecting with others, um, I got involved with what was called Advocates for Informed Choice. It's now called Interact in the United States. And I was the second employee brought on to do kind of communications and fundraising. And then I became the executive director in about a year and you know, um, rebranded it to Interact. And we did a lot of work with youth voices and empowering youth voices to, to speak out and advocate for themselves and others. And it was while I was in Iraq, I've been, I haven't been there for a few years, that Robbie, the writer and director of this film, reached out to me, found me online, and said, would you review a, do a sensitivity read on this script? I've got this idea, and you know, I'm a little skeptical because this happens sometimes, and you know, sometimes it's not so great. Mm -hmm. But Rob, I loved, I loved Robbie, I loved his script, mm -hmm. and, um, it was interesting, the reason he even heard about it, he's a gay man, but he had, he had no knowledge of intersex. He's from South Carolina. And he was reading in a local paper a story from a few years ago about a lawsuit that was brought against uh, the hospital system in South Carolina, actually by my organization, mm -hmm. to uh, protect the child that had, or to litigate for this child based on the harm that they suffered in, the, mm -hmm. in, at, uh, mm -hmm. in state care. They were in the foster care system. So it wasn't a case where we were uh, litigating against the parents. It was the state. Mm -hmm. Anyways, he read that and reached out to interact. And then the rest just, we, you know, I got more and more involved in the film. And I did some yeah. fundraising for it and ended up just being an executive producer. And we're still, we're just wrapping up our year of screening at film festivals. Mm -hmm. Which has been really neat, and we're going to um, we're going to get it onto Amazon mm -hmm. this fall. That's and um, also, uh, it's really important to us that it's available to everyone for advocacy purposes. So we're going to get it up on YouTube for free. Oh yeah. wow! Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's really amazing. And I can imagine that going to the different film festivals and all of the showings that you've had, that there have been probably some really meaningful conversations mm -hmm. that it's have been, happened. I haven't been able to go to many of them. It's funny, it's been it's getting a lot of attention outside of the US and we, we have no budget. So like there's <laughs> literally we crowdfunded to make this film. Um, but it is. The ones I've been able to go to or the ones Robbie's been able to go to, we, we always have these really rewarding moments. Even if it's just one person that's like, wow, I knew nothing about this, you yeah. know? And there's always at least one person, if not many more, that didn't know anything about it. Yeah, I, um, I'm just, I'm curious if there's, a, you know, an experience or a story, that a conversation that's come from the viewing mm. um, or showing that's really impacted you in a profound way that you could share with us? I wish I had this like great dramatic story to, to share. I don't think, I think it's been more a cumulative effect of yeah. just a lot of people being like, wow, I didn't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I thought I knew what intersex was. Usually they think it's the same as trans. But mm -hmm. now I get it. I get the differences. And there, you know, and there are similarities as well, as, as you can imagine. Right, yeah. Well, thank you again for putting this out into the world. Um, I really appreciate what you shared about your personal story mm -hmm. and also just the significance of so much of your story occurring here in Vermont and mm -hmm. um, connected to the UVM Medical Center, which Taylor and I work at I and um, others here as well. Yeah. And um, I really appreciated your point about how when you said not only were you lied to, but so were your parents. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if um, you could share a little bit about how this film has impacted your parents if they mm. are living in and have been able mm -hmm. to see it? Mm -hmm. um, yes, they've both seen it. I think they've both reacted positively to it, at least as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, understandably, I think there's probably a part of them that finds it really hard to watch this film and also mm -hmm. gets a little defensive. Mm -hmm. 
as parents do. I'm, I'm a parent. I have kids. I get it. You know, like mm -hmm. I was just trying to do what was in your best interest. You know, I was yeah. thinking of you. So, like most intersex people I know, we're not we're not blaming our parents. We're not mm -hmm. trying to bash our parents. It's more of um, it's more of like kind of because we all grow up in the era that we grow up in with the influences mm -hmm. we grow up in with the knowledge or the lack of resources. Like my parents don't have access to the internet. Yeah. Like if my kids have anything, something minor, mm -hmm. all I have to do is Google and I'm like a doctor suddenly, you know. And I, <laughs> like my parents didn't have that, nor did they have any psychosocial support. Yeah. And nor did I, yeah. by the way, as a kid. Mm -hmm. So. That just didn't exist. So things are a little better now than my story. Like, I, you know, let's be clear. Um, particularly at some health centers that are really trying to do the right thing, that have some great doctors, usually young medical residents, um, who are, who get it and are helping to, to make a difference, which isn't easy in these big institutions, as no. we all know. No, it's not. I, but I, yeah, I feel what you're saying around the, the learners often mm -hmm. pushing the envelope and really forcing faculty to re-examine what they've learned and be, engage in their unlearning process. And we're seeing that across the country. Yeah, I'm I not agree. just talking about here. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I can imagine. Um, I'm glad that it's happening here also. Yes. <laughs> <I'm concerned. laughs> 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah. Uh, so it's surprising to learn that medically unnecessary non-consensual surgeries are still happening today to many intersex infants and young children. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about the current situation? Sure. Um, so here in the United States, I mean, some things have absolutely gotten better since I was a child. Like what happened to me is a lot less likely to happen now. Um, there's more of an understanding and a questioning on behalf of parents um, and the community around the supposed cancer scare, for example. In my particular diagnosis, and there are many, mm -hmm. the cancer scare was risk was so incredibly low. So mm -hmm. others that have my same condition now, the lucky ones, are keeping their gonads intact, getting mm -hmm. monitored regularly, having the benefit of naturally produced hormones, not having to go on hormone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. which is something I had to start to do as a young teen. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely still no research or data on the impacts of that or what the doses should be or anything. So total, total, you know, rab, I've been a total lab rat my whole mm -hmm. life, um, as have hundreds and hundreds of others that I know. Mm -hmm. So um, that part's getting better. The non-disclosure model of don't tell them, they'll never know, like what he said, the doctor said in the film. I can't say that it never happens anymore, but it's very unlikely to happen these days, right? Um, there, it's more about a, giving appropriate information to a child at age-appropriate ways and supporting them. And in the be best case, there's psychosocial support for families. Yeah. You know, some of the... Um, multidisciplinary care centers in the United States are really trying to bring in multidisciplinary care and attack it from all angles to support mm -hmm. the family in the best case. But even at those centers, mm -hmm. <laughs> some of these unnecessary surgeries are still happening 100%. Like, you know, reducing the size of an infant's clitoris because it's too big and, or it's deemed to be too big mm -hmm. by somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, things like that are still happening. Um, there are two hospitals, to my knowledge, only two, that have come out and, and actually publicly said, okay, we're going to stop doing some of these surgeries, they, you know, as a result of activism. Mm -hmm. um, and that is Boston Children's and Lurie Children's in okay. Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done it differently. Lurie actually issued an apology. Um, and uh, went a little bit further in, in what it said. It refused to say that it wouldn't do those clitoral surgeries that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there's huge exceptions. Yeah. Boston Children's honestly got pushed into a corner by CNN asking them questions. I don't know why, how that happened. Mm -hmm. And they, they had to kind of say, listen, yeah, we're, we're going to stop doing these vaginoplasties on infants because it's not, you know, not necessary. Mm -hmm. So there is progress. Mm -hmm. But it's still happening, yeah. and there's lots of other places. Um, in New York, mm -hmm. um, the New York public hospital system has banned all surgeries in their public hospitals. I'm not sure that many of the surgeries were happening in their public hospitals, to be honest. Mm -hmm. They're getting referred out to, to private hospitals, but still, it's yeah. very symbolic. Mm -hmm. um, the state of New York and the city of New York actually was first mm -hmm. um, passed laws to uh, 
put together public health educational campaigns around this issue mm -hmm. aimed at parents and physicians. And so that's, I think that's a really important first step that we should see happen more. Um, mm -hmm. But there are no laws in the United States at the federal or state level that ban these kind of surgeries. Mm -hmm. There are some laws that ban these surgeries at a national level globally. So mm -hmm. we have about nine laws now, mm -hmm. um, and they're all really different. Some of them mm -hmm. have um, prison sentences for doctors. I mean, Greece. Um, <clears throat> others are not, you know, criminal statutes. So there's a whole array of bans, and mm -hmm. they usually tend to include an age cutoff around 15. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's the right age or the wrong age, but that's just the facts. It seems to be mm -hmm. right around where they say it's you know illegal to do this without a person without the patient's consent under age 15, and you know I think it's still a debate about and probably somewhat case by case about what you know when a person is able to make right. make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, so there are some laws. Um, mm -hmm. The United Nations has looked at this issue for years, and uh, just recently, um, in April, um, the Human Rights um, uh, Council in Geneva passed uh, the first ever intersex resolution, basically saying intersex people should be protected, these harms are happening, and they're, um, they're, the Office of the High Commissioner is putting together a report on, on this now. Um, and even though it's just a report, and that sounds kind of like a whatever, mm -hmm. It's amazing what kind of attention that can get. And it, it, it sort of brought this issue, it, I've already seen it in the last few months, it's given it a lot more credibility. Mm -hmm. Should have had credibility without that, but mm -hmm. sometimes that's what it takes. Um, right. yeah, yeah, and you answered some of um, the other curiosities that I had around the regulations for mm -hmm. medical professionals. Yeah. And then and then what, what does the landscape look like for um, intersex advocacy Nash, uh, excuse me, globally. Mm -hmm. I imagine that it varies country to country. It varies country to country. It's really changed in the last five years even. Um, in Europe, it's been quite strong and uh, stronger, longer than it has been here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're seeing most of the laws being passed as well. Mm -hmm. um, Australia, a couple of territories in Australia have made big changes. Uh, one territory or state, I think they might call it, in India has made changes, but not at the national level. Mm -hmm. um, but there are groups and regional intersex organizations, mm -hmm. um, both in Asia and Africa, um, mm -hmm. and lots of groups in Latin America, not, not a regional organization yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to Bangkok and meeting with 26 mm -hmm. other intersex leaders from around the globe for our first like global convening to kind of talk strategy at a big picture level for our movement because it's becoming so big. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love that Bangkok is the place that you all are meeting. Yeah. And it's just, Thailand is such a special place. Mm. It, there's something that feels so sacred about mm. um, how they um, uh, think about and in, um, lead with inclusion. I don't know if he's been there before. I've no. never been there before, but I definitely am aware of that. And yeah. also, interestingly, talking to some of the um, activist intersex people uh, who live in Bangkok, mm -hmm. they say th there's still a lot of discrimination against intersex and this mm -hmm. issue of like you have a, you're disordered, like you're born mm -hmm. with a disorder that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So even though they're a lot more progressive on like gender fluidness, yeah. there's still kind of that pathologizing happening. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, uh, the advances that have been made, for example, in Kenya, which is a very anti-LGBT uh, place, um, mm -hmm. they've advocated for years um, on behalf of intersex kids, and some of these people advocating, by the way, are queer and they're just not out, mm -hmm. but they're advocating for the protection of intersex children using a children's rights and health framework, mm -hmm. which can be at times a little pathologizing, but if it's helping kids not be killed at birth, it's kind of like you, you do what you need to do. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that, like, mm -hmm. I'm realizing the more I do this international work is, like, I can't come in with my global north concepts mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. thoughts. And, you know, because there's such huge 
pervasive differences happening in, yes. in each country and the culture and the religious influence in the culture and how po politics works. Mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing and it all comes to play. Um, but I can say that there are other countries making much more progress than the United States. Yeah, it's not surprising. I feel like that may be the case across the board for many, <laughs> for many Sadly. things. Sadly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the parents in the film mm -hmm. were clearly struggling with the impact of the irreversible decision they made yeah. um, in their child's best interest as an infant. Uh, how can we support families? I think understanding that this is helping expecting parents, first of all, to know that this is something that can happen and it's not necessarily an emergency. It's mm -hmm. to make it a little bit more mainstream and within the quote unquote norm of expectations. Like, as far as I know, the what to expect when you're expecting book and other books like it, but that's the biggie. I don't think they address this still. Mm -hmm. Like what, you know, like, even just getting a chapter or two pages in that book, I think, can go a long way. Yeah. Um, so it's helping to manage expectations and, and also provide support and mm -hmm. resources for, for parents, mm -hmm. um, both basic information and psychosocial support, because it is really understandably, right? Parents are, are usually in a very vulnerable state mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. a child is born and they're given this information. And it's also another thing medical providers and healthcare practitioners can do is it's also how you communicate and it's how you talk about the issues, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just the words coming out of your mouth, it's the body language, mm -hmm. it's the tone of voice, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's kind of that white coat thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I think if there's more training yeah. and guidance given to, to doctors, and it's primary care physicians. I mean, they're often the ones that deal with this first. Right. Um, like this doctor in the film. Mm -hmm. He was a prime. I don't know if you could tell, but he was a primary care physician. I'm always wondering if people could tell. Mm -hmm. And you know how he's kind of like, um, and looking at his file. Like, yeah. that was on purpose because we didn't want, he's not the specialist. He was the guy that was like, I'm going to refer you to a specialist to fix this. Yeah. And, you know, it's amazing when I even talk to like, I don't know, I'll go to my podiatrist and be like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I advocate for intersex kids. Really? What's that? Oh, yeah, I thought, th they used to do that a long time ago. I thought that stopped. You know, it's like, no, people don't know. If it's not yeah. your area of expertise, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. just, you're like, oh, yeah, I heard about that. But that right. doesn't happen anymore. It's like, yes, it does. <laughs> Ask your yeah. medical association. Well, it speaks to the need for it to be a part of continuing medical education. Definitely. And, and medical, medical education. education. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In the beginning. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I had another thought, it just left me, but, um, oh, just when also thinking about the, um, the medical institution and the medical field in general and who has the privilege of advocating and being listened to and heard, right. and which communities don't. Like, mm -hmm. I'm imagining that there's probably even disparities when you look within the intersex community when you break it down by race. Totally. Or religion. Yep. Or other demographics. Absolutely. I mean, even, you know, I was talking about that support group that I got connected with when I was 40, and I, you know, got a lot of support online, and then they have an annual conference every year. 90% of the people there are white. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you're white, you're privileged, you have a certain economic status to even get yourself to a conference mm -hmm. to get this kind of information. So there's still a lot of people that are not accessing mm -hmm. the support that they need or the information that they need. Mm -hmm. um, so you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, that comes into play. And then... Yeah, I mean, all the other cultural and race dynamics that go come into, like, mm -hmm. healthcare and right. our world generally also, of course, right. affect, affect status, this, economic status, yeah. yeah, all of that. Um, and religion and different cultures, mm -hmm. you know, there are many different cultures here in the United States, so I've actually mm -hmm. heard from doctors tell stories about how, in some cases, they've, they've tried to say, actually, no, we don't think surgery is the right thing to do right now. Mm -hmm. And they have parents pushing back hard, and they're saying, if you don't do this surgery, mm -hmm. my extended family is not going to accept this child. Mm -hmm. like, like, you have to make them normal. Like, mm -hmm. So it's tough. It's not just the doctors. It's, it's society and mm -hmm. different you know, cultural beliefs and religious beliefs. And, yeah. and I'm sorry, but homophobia comes into play, too. Yeah. Like, yes. there's no way that that baggage that some 
professionals have doesn't come to their decision making and their advice when they're talking to parents. Mm -hmm. um, there's this old, you know, outdated belief that I think, you know, was pretty common that in the early days, well, oh, little children, little girls, most of them were XX, assumed to be girls, with large clitorises are going to end up being lesbians. You know, that was one of the rationales for doing the surgery. Wow. <laughs> so it's all very, it's all very intertwined and everybody's baggage is coming to the surface when these decisions are being made, everybody's mm -hmm. beliefs and prejudices. Yeah. And how an, an injustice impacts one community, it impacts us all. Totally. <laughs> like it's right. all interconnected. Um, so a final question before we take it to the audience for Q&A. Um, how can we do better? I feel like for the my back's to you guys. Sorry. <laughs> I just realized this. I'll turn this way when I can. Yeah. Um, and um, how can we do better for the intersex community, mm -hmm. um, for people like yourself and young Mary in the film? I mean, I think just like, like I was saying, like, educating yourself and then educating others is always a really big first step. Mm -hmm. So recommending this film, having a conversation with people, you know, at, at the dinner table or when you're out with friends or just being like, I just heard, saw this film or I just have this discussion. Are y'all aware of this? This is outrageous. I think that's the kind of conversations that we need to keep having. And within the queer communities specifically, there also needs to be more education. There's still a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and some of that's understandable, honestly, because a good number, perhaps a majority, of the people that meet the definition of intersex, number one, don't even choose to use that label for themselves. Mm -hmm. And number two, don't necessarily want to be associated with the broader mm -hmm. queer umbrella. Not that they're homophobic. It's something bigger than that. It's mm -hmm. it's fear of any sort of stigma, and if they can go on and pass mm -hmm. and be quiet, most are continuing to do that. I think the, the ones that you're seeing, most of the intersex people that you're seeing like on TikTok or Instagram mm -hmm. or speaking out in other ways, doing events like this, are also queer. And so I think there's a little bit of a, and I work for, I work for a, an organization that advocates for LGBTQI plus human rights, mm -hmm. I, and I'm straight. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I have a queer body, and I'm very much an ally, so I'm fine to be called queer. Mm -hmm. But I think most people, mm -hmm. intersex women with my same demographic mm -hmm. and condition, aren't. Mm -hmm. And so there's this kind of tension a little mm -hmm. bit. So I think within the LGBT community, I was saying, I also kind of get it, because I hear a lot from organizations that are like, well, we don't really know enough to be inclusive and we don't want to do the wrong thing. Great, good answer. And also, we're not sure the intersex people want to be a part of this. And so it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I'm just putting it out there. There is that tension that's real, um, which is why I also am increasingly a big advocate for not just the LGBTQ community globally, as well as the United States, stepping up Mm -hmm. for the intersex community, but we need children's rights advocates. There are huge children's rights organizations. I mean, we're talking about, in some countries, kids being killed at birth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, there's a lot of similarities in some cases with the uh, anti-FGM, female genital mutilation community, yeah. and, and movement. And in Europe, I know they're starting to make some headway collaborating there. Um, yeah. Certainly hasn't happened here in the US. I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah because it's, it's there's so much hypocrisy with, with these uh, these laws that exist at the federal and, and state level, and you know where they're making it criminal mm -hmm. to to do those procedures or mm -hmm. surgeries when they're it's really the same thing. Yeah. It's just happening to to other children in hospitals. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a real issue in Canada. They're federal anti-FGM law has a specific exception for intersex children. So wow. the United States law doesn't. I was just trying to wrap my mind around that. Yeah, <laughs> in Canada, which wow. is pretty queer friendly compared to many countries, but they have a specific ex exception. And so there's been litigation happening kind of behind the scenes. There's, um, there's some advocacy happening. I mean, there's there's an organized attempt, a very under-resourced organized attempt, to change that, to remove that exception. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but I mean, just even like the rationale, like what do, do you have insight into? I think I think it's because there's been such a you know medical lobby towards like doing these surgeries because mm -hmm. surgeons fix things, right? And mm -hmm. so, and and there's this assumption and this paradigm of these children need to be fixed. They need to fit the binary boxes of either a male or female body for their own good so that they grow up and are not made fun of in the locker room, can pee standing up, mm -hmm. you know, are accepted, can have a loving relationship so their parents accept them when they're infants. Mm -hmm. That's another mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, kind of parental, let's fix the parental distress. Right. Um, so the medical community has had a huge influence on that, yeah. and that's that's hard to undo. Yeah, I. This is unrelated, but probably related because most things in life are around identity. But thinking also around the movement for more open adoptions versus closed, mm. and recognizing what is psychologically healthier, healthier. typically, typically yeah. for the the parents and the child, mm -hmm. um, and how the medical community had such a huge influence on mm -hmm. making you know, the zeitgeist around it being a closed that's right. adoption. Um, no, that's right. There are, there are similarities there. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess the last thing just to touch upon mm -hmm. what's happening here in the United States across many states are these, you know, uh, anti-trans and anti-gender affirming care for trans youth bills and laws that are getting mm -hmm. passed. Mm -hmm. Many have exceptions for intersex children. So similarly, mm -hmm. you know, that the... the the groups that are advocating for these laws are saying parents and doctors are, are mutilating children's genitals. This needs to stop. First of all, we all know that's not what happens to a young child, but mm -hmm. that's the narrative. Mm -hmm. However, if the child is born intersex, it's okay to, to fix them. I mean, it doesn't say this, but basically mm -hmm. it's like, well, they're disordered, they need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. But these other kids are normal and don't screw them up by changing their body, you know? So it's, and one of my gripes, I'll be honest, is what I'm witnessing, and my, again, my advocacy in the last couple of years has been focused outside the US, but what I'm witnessing inside the US is the intersex groups being really good siblings to their trans peers mm -hmm. and standing with them and connecting and being one, and sometimes people are trans and intersex, and that's a real thing, and that's like, mm -hmm. I get it. And also, I'm not seeing it coming from the, from the trans community. Uh, I'm yeah. not seeing mm -hmm. that coming back, and, and you know, they're arguing, keep the government out of this discussion. It's between parents and the child and mm -hmm. the doctor. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, this rises to the level mm -hmm. of needing to bring in government regulation to, mm -hmm. to to you know, protect these young children, yeah. it should not be a parent's decision, and it should not be just mm -hmm. the doctor's decision. Mm -hmm. So we're at complete odds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and believe it or not, there's way more intersex people than there are trans people, but we're not as well funded or organized and don't have as many out people. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to pit the two moves together at all. Mm -hmm. Huge ally all together. Mm -hmm. But one of my gripes is that I don't see, I mean, some of these trans advocates <clears throat> have huge platforms. You, many of you know who they are. And, and they, they get on TV or they get on a podcast or whatever and they, they don't say anything about these exceptions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I find it frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, that I that I had thought about that, and I really appreciate you naming that because that's something that I think many of us can carry forward in our advocacy. So that's why I wanted to say yeah. it because Thank your you question was that. like, "What can we do?" It was like, yeah. "Notice that, yes. yeah, and yeah. you know, try to raise that up." Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'd love to hear from all of you what questions you have for Kimberly. Water. Um, and my colleague Hajar is going to be kind. And Thanks so much, Kimberly. So great to have you here and just want to boost the lack of the trans conversation and including intersex. One thing that I'm seeing everywhere, especially with the push for SOGI data collection, is we're seeing X gender markers. We're talking about trans care left and right, but we're not including intersex folks in the sex assigned at birth. Might we not 
assign them sex at birth, but we are. Do you have guidance around what are those options? I've seen right. other ambiguous, undetermined in Vermont. There's no congruence. Do you have recommendations? That's a great question. Um, this is an issue where there isn't, there's differences of opinion in the movement across the country, across the globe. Um, for example, in Kenya, what they did, I think they were the first country, maybe it was in 2015, that 2019, that counted intersex people specifically in their national census with good intentions, like stand up and be counted so we can protect you as the government, we can help you. Um, there's also movement, there's also a, a movement to put I for intersex on birth certificates when it's known at birth, and often it's not, by the way. Um, and there's varying opinions on this. I mean, you know, you can argue in some cultures and environments that having a mandatory intersex marker might drive parents to do early surgery to avoid that weird new marker. Let's make them an M or an F. Um, they did. They tried that in Germany, and there's been a few years where they're starting to see the data that like this has been problematic. It hasn't actually been helpful. Um, there's also an argument that some will make that by doing that allows for kind of all possibilities and puts less pressure on like naming a, a sex and certainly a gender. Um, so it's a great question. I have a personal opinion about it, but I also am swayed almost daily depending on who I'm talking to and what country and you know, kind of like how it affects their reality. Next question. Hi. Oh, are you hearing the feedback? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Kara. I'm intersex. Um, and I am so excited to have seen your film and to have you here. Um, and I just want to be one more out um, and say that, yeah, there's enough people in here to. Oh, there's enough people in here to be 2%, right? <laughs> so there's gotta be. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I guess actually I just wanna make a couple comments on, on what you've said um, and, and feel some back and forth here. Um, I appreciate so much the reminder that you also made about not everybody knows at birth, right? Because there are so many different variations of it. I didn't know until I was 16. Um, I, I also want to apologize because at one point you were saying something and I got so excited, like that spot on that I like snapped my finger and pointed at you <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I really just want to make sure it's very, very clear that it's enthusiasm and I just can't emphasize enough as a point that you made that, um, you know, there's all these intersections and, um, and and it's so hard to to create movements around something that is shared, right? Like we have these these parts of our experience that overlap, but one intersex person's experience compared to another's can be just so wildly different. Um, and so I have my own, um, but as it sounds, you do as you do too. Um, like huge problems with um, the medical, <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say it right now, but like medical community, right? Like my healthcare providers, um, even though I was so lucky to have a condition where, condition, where um, the, it wasn't noticeable when I was born, right? We only found out when I was 16. So I was old enough to say, holy fuck, that kind of surgery sounds so scary um, that I don't care how this surgeon is looking at me so eagerly. I'm the guinea pig. They can't wait to cut me open. Um, with I will never forget, like, these, this huge smile, like, just, ugh. 
um, and uh, and thinking at the time, you know, or across the years here, I'm 38 now, um, that like I'm so lucky I got out of ha- being, you know, mutilated at birth, but also realizing how ongoing, um, having not had a surgery though, ongoing how much I still face in the medical community with their non-education of this. Every time I see a new doctor or as I get a new PCP and we go through time and time again, um, meeting with them at first, it's always educating them. It's exhausting, right? And because there are so many different presentations of intersex, um, I wouldn't expect them to know, having had a different intersex patient, what my healthcare needs are. Um, and so this, the amount of education and just so many forms still, it, just it, it, in the community that is supposed to be like treating and supporting intersex people, having just the F and the M. And once you get in to that system one way, you can't switch it, um, is... Uh, it it so forces that invisibility and um, and always makes me feel like it's not two percent even. And I remember when I found out that I had Mayorokatansky Kuster Hauser syndrome, um, <laughs> vaginal agenesis, um, that there was it was like one in five thousand women who experienced this. I was like, why am I not meeting any other people that have this then? I'm so alone. Um, And so, like, as soon as uh, a friend of mine said that this was happening, I was just like, yes, I don't know how to connect with my own intersex community. The last time I did was in, like, Yahoo chat rooms when I was 16, being like, what the fuck am I, you know, facing here? And what are other people feeling? I remember when I found out, what I would do is I would introduce myself – because my parents were like, you know, you don't need to tell anybody. You know, this is a private thing, you know. Um, I remember I would I would meet people and I'd put my hand out and I would just be like, hi, I'm Kara, I don't have a uterus. You know, like that was just one part of my whole body's uh, makeup. And um, I had learned, obviously, that like carrying a child was never going to happen. Um which at 16, I didn't want kids anyway. I was like, could not imagine a future that way. So it was just so bizarre. Um, I'm trying to stop myself from telling like my full story because it goes on and on again. But uh, one of the things that happened really recently as far as like healthcare is concerned and the uh, and bodily autonomy and consent, um, again, I'm 38. So like I've known about my... Um, intersexuality and and so much and my queerness and and all that and I've struggled with my gender identity and uh the way that my body is built and presents for for okay that makes it somebody do math 22 years so I've had a lot of time with this um and I love my body now and I love it the way that it is um I've and and I now have a completely different medical event that has occurred because of my intersex anatomy. And, um, and now I will probably need surgery for it. Um, but Hey, we're in a medical space. I had a rectal prolapse (laughs) and butts and guts. And, uh, and in order to have that surgery, like one of the ways that the medical community um, uh, handles that is they sew your rectum to your vaginal canal if you have one, right? I don't. So the doctor that I saw in Cleveland, right, because I have a fantastic doctor at University of Vermont Medical Center now, um, Dr. Evans, and, um, and I adore her, but she said, hey, listen, I don't know a single person in New England that I feel confident can do this surgery on your specific body where you won't have a recurrence with this prolapse. (laughs) 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Here, I'll turn mine off. Back, so we turned it off. Um, yes, there is very little intersex affirming and intersex competent care for adults anywhere in the world. In the world. So <clears throat> you're really lucky, and the best you're going to get, and if others disagree, please chime in, is a doctor who's compassionate and understanding and willing to learn and work with you. But we do end up being our own best advocates, and sometimes that's exhausting, and you just want someone to step up and take care of you. But there has been a lack of medical education around these issues. Um, so that is another huge thing, and we focus a lot on the issues of children and surgery and non-consensual. But us intersex adults, myself included, at 58 and pretty well connected, I don't have an intersex doctor. I don't have a doctor that I can go to, and I never have. So I rely on my primary care doctor, and I'm very selective about who that is now, and I've learned the hard way. Um, and I educate them, and I find someone that's going to work with me. And that's the best we have, but that's not good enough. And I can give you a little hope that a couple years ago at Pride, actually, President Biden issued an executive order on a bunch of LGBTQI things. Yes, he actually said the word intersex. Mm -hmm. And I almost lost it. I was like, I can't believe a president of the United States is saying the word intersex. I don't think he knew what it meant, by the way. <laughs> But his staff did, and that's really what matters, as we all know. So he said it, and he mandated the Department of Health and Human Services to put together a, a research report on intersex health equities, inequities, sorry. And that report um, got done with feedback from the community, a bunch of stakeholders, um, and it hasn't come out yet for political reasons. It's being held up, but it is going to come out, and I think it will come out before the end of this year after the election. But that's something to look forward to, not that it's going to change the world by this report coming out immediately, but it tackles a lot of issues around health data collection, cancer screenings, primary care services for intersex, a number of issues, not just the surgeries that are happening in children, but yes, it mentions that too, and makes some recommendations to involve a number of different agencies within the US government to get involved and commit to this community that has really been uh, underrepresented and underserved. Mm -hmm. So it, progress is slow, but it's I, in the works. I appreciate that so much because I'm totally going to look forward to that report for sure. <laughs> you and me both. I tell you. <laughs> um, I'm going to say one other thing, and then I got to pass it because other people. I, I want to hear all these voices, um, but I will say that that doctor. One of the things that I appreciate about her was her saying too. I'm not going to use you as the guinea pig. Try to get this done, and mm -hmm. then it's going to have a you know relapse or something. Um, she sent me though to a, a surgeon in Cleveland, um, so I was really looking forward, thinking that like good, you know, she recognized her uh, limitations, and of course I went there, and then. <laughs> the way that the doctor tried to kind of like relate to me and my intersexuality was indeed comparing um, her experience doing volunteer work, um, correcting surgeries on children in Africa, did not specify the, co the country, just the continent, um, in Africa with genital mutilation. Right. And I was like, I know the overlaps here. This, you, th we are not, we are not connecting here. This is I, this is not a bedside manner that's getting me to like make it feel like you understand who I am. Um, mm -hmm. And at the end, said that they needed to talk to a gender affirming surgeon mm -hmm. because they wanted to figure out if maybe they do make a vaginal canal for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it just felt so like, oh no 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 no, like this is, should not be assumed the way that we're going to do this surgery. And I fell into a spiral of like. Well, it's gender identity all over again. What are we doing here? Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to share that in the full scope of the the, the yeah. strange medical experience I'm going yeah. through when I didn't think I'd have to go through another one. I'm yeah. sorry. Thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah. But again, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um, so 
With the crossover of the trans experience and intersex experience, I'm curious if you can speak to um, like gender dysphoria, gender euphoria, and how that um, can present. I am not an expert in that area, not being a trans person myself, but I, I, all I can say is that I know a number of intersex people who also are of trans experience, whether they identify that way or not. And sure, there's, I mean, I would say generally speaking, there's some similarities and struggles around body dysmorphia and acceptance and that ties in sometimes to gender identity and all those things. Um, so it's real. So there are, I mean, and so intersex and trans do get conflated quite a bit amongst the general population who aren't quite, don't, don't even know the difference between gender and sex, first of all. Let's be, <laughs> let's be straight. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> um, so yes, I think that is why also people get so confused. Um, so I think we also have to be patient with people. Some people, no, we don't have to be patient with. But most people we have to be patient because it's a learning curve. I mean, I even just like my parents or their friends, like they're trying to be supportive and they're like read my book or they're, and it's like, well, why does this have to be a queer thing? I mean, you were just born this way. I was like, oh, whatever, you know? So it's hard, but I, I do see hope in the younger generations. <laughs> I mean, by younger, I'm meaning like some of them are now pushing 40. So it's shifting, you know, it's shifting. And particularly in the medical community, um, I hate to say it, but sometimes we just need that old way of thinking to retire and like move on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we talk about that on our yeah. too. <laughs> and this just doesn't really, this is not just an intersex issue. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> A lot of these issues we're talking about actually aren't just intersex issues. When Sorry I about the backlash. You. Yeah, um, I'm Wendy. I'm a psychologist at the hospital alongside Marissa. Um, this is kind of a therapy-related question, but um, you mentioned that you had more of this discovery at 40, and you had gone through things in your teen years. I'm not sure um, if you had any therapeutic support, but I love how you noted several times about psychosocial um, support. Uh, in just thinking about the population that I'm most passionate in serving, what do you think is most important for therapists to provide more so to, to patients that are like in this realm of identity? I think, God, this sounds so basic, but honestly, this is where we're at. If I... If someone finds, goes to a therapist and they have some ground level of knowledge about what intersex is and what the realm of possible intersex experiences are, maybe they read a paper, maybe they, they heard a talk, that's like a huge step. I mean, that's where we're at. And, and I have a couple of friends who are intersex and psychiatrists mm -hmm. now. Um, and they would be the best ones to ask this question. And I always can connect you with them if that's something you'd like. But yes, I mean, I had, when I was 40, I had already been seeing a therapist for about five years for other stuff. And I was really fortunate. She knew nothing about intersex, but we had a relationship. So I was really fortunate because when the bomb dropped, I could go in with her two weeks later for my next appointment and be like, so wait till you hear this. I just found out I'm intersex and I printed off stuff from the internet. I was like, this is what it means. Help me. And so she was good enough, and I still meet with her regularly online, to help me because she was a good therapist, trauma-informed, just a good therapist. And I think any good therapist, I think, with a little bit of specific knowledge about the lived experience and the possible trauma-related issues that come with it can be an excellent and, I would argue, necessary help to, to a person dealing with these issues. And one more thing on that, I also want to say, I love my therapist, and therapy was huge, but the single best thing I ever did for myself, and it blows therapy out of the water, is connecting with other intersex people. And that one-on-one -on -one experience of you're not alone, oh my God, you get it. And even though there's 40 different ways to be intersex, most of us have that shared shame and stigma, or even shared 
trauma of medicalization, mm -hmm. that despite our body parts, that's what bonds us together. So I, I, I hope that helps. How are we looking on time? Is that the last question? Okay, Perfect. great. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>